Dear students, welcome for the course of Architectural Studies for Engineers. This is lecture number 23. I am your teacher, Ravinder Kumar Khyani, Assistant Professor, Department of Architecture and Planning, Energy University of Engineering and Technology, Karachi, Sindh, Pakistan. As you know that we are discussing the theme architectural restoration and conservation and its impact on construction. And this lecture is in continuation of the previous lecture. In today's lecture, we will see what is cultural heritage and architectural monuments. Why these are significant elements of architecture and construction engineering professions. It is the collective wisdom of past generation for the future generation to appreciate their ancestors or else. Why cultural heritage protection is the responsibility of current generation of architects and construction engineers. We will also analyze how cultural heritage and architectural monuments got affected due to different reasons. Then we will observe what happens at the international scene for the protection of cultural heritage by UNESCO. Still, the World Heritage Sites are at risk, therefore it is also important to understand why so and what to be done. Then we will see some cases of how an architectural and construction engineering firm is doing the work of protecting historic buildings. Finally, we will learn about the different restoration techniques and how architects and construction engineers are working for the restoration projects. In this way, we will have a clear understanding about the impact the restoration and conservation have on the construction engineering. So let's begin. What is cultural heritage? Why these are significant elements of architecture and construction engineering profession? It is the collective wisdom of the past generation for the future generation to appreciate their ancestors or else. Let's see and find out. Cultural heritage. What is it, really? Is it the arts and the architecture we are so keen to admire and enjoy feeling surrounded by? the many iconic buildings whose functions have evolved over centuries. Some of them are now monuments and were once home to people who lived happy or tragic or perfectly ordinary lives. The generations who built and redefined this city forever. Every time it came to one of history's many uncharted crossroads and faced some unimaginably difficult choices. What is cultural heritage? Is it the centuries of change and historical turmoil that have brought us where we are today? The trauma of past wars, invasions and conflicts that have left their indelible marks on who we choose and refuse to be, and how we express ourselves creatively? Or is it the energy of the people who have come here to stay, to live, to visit and revisit for generations? The collective story we are all part of The story we are proud to share with the world, because that's who we are. Heritage is you. Your story. This video was about the Karakhov 
What we understood from the video is that the cultural heritage is an expression of the ways of the living developed by a community and passed on from generation to generation, including customs, practices, places, objects, artistic expressions, and values. Cultural heritage is often expressed as either intangible or tangible cultural heritage. As part of human activity, cultural heritage produces tangible representations of the value systems, beliefs, traditions, and lifestyles. As an essential part of culture as a whole, cultural heritage contains these visible and tangible traces from antiquity to the recent past. Cultural heritage types can be distinguished in built environments, such as in buildings, in town scaps, and archaeological remains. The natural environment, the rural landscapes, the coast and shorelines, agricultural heritage, artifacts, books and documents, objects and pictures, the driving force behind all cultural heritage is a human creation intended to inform of the past to the present and the future. Let's go ahead. Why cultural heritage protection is the responsibility of current generation of architects and construction engineers? How cultural heritage and architectural monuments got affected due to different reasons? What happens at the international scene for the protection of cultural heritage by UNESCO? Let's find out. For millennia, socio-cultural evolution has been expressed through creating and building, whether it be temples, theatres, monuments, sculptures, or any other work of art. These masterpieces help to shape our identity, and yet they're often damaged or even destroyed as a result of armed conflict. This destruction can have catastrophic consequences for current and future generations. In 1954, in the aftermath of the massive destruction of cultural property in the Second World War, the international community unanimously recognized the importance of protecting cultural properties from irreversible damage. And in the spirit of universal responsibility, the Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict was born, now broadly referred to as the 1954 Hague Convention. It is the first international treaty with a worldwide vocation, focusing on the protection of cultural heritage in the event of an armed conflict. The Convention protects movable or immovable property of great importance to international cultural heritage, such as monuments and architecture, archaeological sites, buildings of historical or artistic interest, buildings dedicated to religion, manuscripts, books, and other objects of artistic, historical, or archaeological value, as well as scientific collections and important collections of archives. The 1954 Hague Convention explicitly prohibits the use of cultural property for purposes which are likely to expose it to destruction or damage in the event of armed conflict, and requires all states' parties to refrain from any act of hostility directed against such property. The Convention also requires states' parties to foster within their armed forces a spirit of respect for the cultural property of all peoples. A distinctive emblem is used as a symbol to identify and distinguish cultural property during armed conflict. In addition to this, the 1954 Hague Convention has two protocols. The first protocol, among other things, prevents the exportation of cultural property from an occupied territory during hostilities and requires cultural property that has been unlawfully exported to be returned to its original territory. The second protocol, which was adopted in 1999, strengthens the convention and enhances the protection of cultural heritage in the following ways. It elaborates further on certain terms such as military necessity and preparatory measures and establishes an enhanced level of protection for cultural property that is of the highest importance for humankind. The protocol also requires states parties to criminalize the deliberate destruction of any cultural property. Furthermore, the 1999 Second Protocol establishes a special fund for the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict. This provides emergency assistance to states in their efforts to take preparatory or emergency measures to protect their cultural property. 
Finally, the second protocol establishes a 12-member intergovernmental committee for the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict, which is responsible for monitoring the implementation of the protocol. But what is UNESCO? And what is its role in the implementation of the 1954 Hague Convention? UNESCO is a specialized agency of the United Nations, which aims to contribute to peace and security by promoting collaboration among the nations through education, science and culture. Well, as there are many international protocols for the protection of heritage properties, the professionals also have the responsibility to follow the professional code of conduct to save structures from damages and learn techniques to protect such structures. Let's go ahead. Let's see why World Heritage Sites are at risk and also find out how many and where are the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And what is the tangible and intangible heritage? In 2016, the archaeological site of Philippi in Greece was listed as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. It was one of 21 such sites that made the grade last year. The World Heritage Convention was adopted in 1972 with the aim of protecting the world's most valuable natural and cultural treasures. One of the first World Heritage Sites was the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador. Italy has the most UNESCO World Heritage Sites with 51, followed by China, Spain, France, Germany and Mexico. There are now a total of 1,052 World Heritage Sites around the world, in 165 countries. 814 of them are cultural sites that may have historical or anthropological value. 203 are natural sites that may include habitats for threatened species. And 35 are a mixture of both types. But some of them are at risk. Of 229 sites identified by the World Wildlife Fund as being significant for their natural value in 2016, almost half are threatened by industrial development, such as illegal logging, mining and oil and gas development. Being designated a World Heritage Site can bring attention and put pressure on governments to protect areas, but the publicity can also cause an uptick in tourism to the sites, leading to further degradation. 55 World Heritage Sites are listed as being in danger, some of them due to... So, we have seen that there are various elements which causes the heritage site for risk. Then there are intangible heritage also. Intangible heritage also involve the uh, music or you can say the yoga or you can say there is another, uh, the Turkish tea for example, Turkish coffee is also uh, intangible heritage. So architects and construction engineers are mainly concerned with tangible heritage and that is building and the built environment. So let's, so, let's go ahead and see uh, how architects or you can say construction engineers are trying to uh, conserve the historical sites. Let's see some cases of how architectural and construction engineering firm is doing the work of protecting the historic buildings. The renovation of historic buildings an emerging domain of professional services for architects and construction engineers. Ellison Auksher is an architectural firm that was able to help us both with the restoration of our historic buildings and turn them into modern facilities. The downtown library has a beautiful hand-laid terrazzo floor, but over the years it had cracked, so there were large cracks in it. And the team here from Ellison Auksher Architects, they found a company who could restore that floor, and we were able to save the floor, and it is still a beautiful terrazzo floor today. 
Projects are different from new construction to renovations and remodeling and re reconstruction work. And sometimes the renovation projects are more satisfying than the new construction. Just because you see a building that someone has been in for years and years and put up with and made do. And then when you go in and you do a restoration or renovation project, it's almost like a brand new building. And so those owners, I think, really see the change from beginning to end. They continue to help us with issues. Things come up. Uh, we're working on replacing sidewalks at the two Carnegie branches. And who did we call when that came up? We called Ellison Oksher Architects. Well, let's go ahead and find out other uh, case studies. Let's see another project of the firm and see how client satisfaction is achieved by the firm. As a professional architects and construction engineers, it is our responsibility to deliver projects on time and for full involvement of our profession. Through the years, Wyatt Park has used Ron for multiple projects, the biggest being a, a major renovation that was done in 1994. That was a, well over a million dollars. But when we began talking about the project that we're working on now, he spent a lot of time on Sundays just watching how people move. And he was able then to say, here's where people bottleneck, here's where things hang up, here's what we can do to alleviate that. I've never encountered Ron coming in and say, you've got this many square feet, here's how it needs to be laid out. It's always, what do you wanna do in this space? How's it gonna be used? What different groups are gonna be using it? What are they gonna be doing in here? Then we'll talk about exactly what the space looks like. For the past 10 years, we have looked at the need for a new Wesley Center. I think Ron and his staff have been masterful in helping to say, here's what we hear, and uh, here's what we see, and uh, what if. All of those things uh, to help communicate to not just us, but to the community as well, that's extremely important. Most communities have a habitat subdivision, at least one, and we didn't have one. So Ron really helped me with the vision of what it was we wanted in that project, what it could look like, how many families could we serve in it, and Ron is the number one person <laughs> that I thought of to call. We as a church family really wrestled with where we were going and what we were doing as far as our space needs and our ministry needs and how to complement and how to coordinate the various demands that were coming to our building. We decided to ask for the assistance of an architectural firm. In that process, we interviewed four different architectural firms as a committee. Out of that, we chose to, to go with Ellison Oxshire. Uh, they were a firm that uh, we felt like could hear our unique needs. The final product is more outstanding than we begin to fathom nor imagine. They were exceptional at uh, coordinating uh, their expertise with our needs and our studies so that we could, we could build a facility that would meet the needs of our local fellowship. Well, let's go ahead and find out another case study of the same firm. As an architect and construction engineers, we do a variety of projects, and it's very crucial to work for the benefit of the communities in which we live our life. As a professional architect and construction engineer, the aim should be to deal with all kinds of problems and issues to create good built environment. Let's see the case study, how it is done. We've 
done a whole myriad of things with Telus and Auksher. Our latest uh, office building, 28,000 square feet, two-story, we had them do that for us. They, uh, they had done the original building back in the late 80s, and so um, um, it, it worked out so well for us, we just built another one. The library started working with Ellison Auksher around 2000. Ellison Auksher was chosen as the architect to renovate the three existing buildings and also to uh, plan the construction of the uh, East Hills Library. If you have a building project, Ellison Auksher will, will do a good job for you. They, they will help you right from the uh, inception up through uh, the construction and even into modifications because we've actually modified buildings that we've uh, built with them as well. Furthermore, let's see another case study. In architectural conservation and restoration projects, the sensibility towards the structure is very important. And a single element of old architecture can create a harmonious whole in the whole project. The client's needs are quite important and good professionals focus on the needs and wants of the client and provide solution with efficiency. Let's see how this company have done in this respect. This was the first architect that we had had that had really embraced that vision of uh, what we wanted to accomplish. We were looking for uh, facilities that would look good, good 100 years ago and look good 100 years from now. And he really embraced that. Uh, we wanted buildings that would match the Benedictine College architecture that existed at the turn of the century. found in working with the Ellison Oxshire firm that uh, they are just a phone call away. Uh, countless times I have called them up and asked for advice, I've called them up for information. It's just endless the, the amount of time that they have given to me personally uh, as the director but to the institution. What they do is they come to us and they say, what do you want? And they listen and they go back and they draw things up and they design it and they come back to us and we say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you're able to take one meeting and get us, okay, which they've been able to, to do. They walked our campus, they looked at Elizabeth Hall, which was built around the turn of the century, and Fink Hall, and they said, okay, what can we pull from them? Let's take this brick look all the way to the top, let's look at the peaks, let's look at the dormers at the top, arched windows, and they pulled the arches. They could have done typical rounded arches, but what they said is, you have a kind of a unique arch here in the Haverty Center, and so I want to take that arch and I want to incorporate that in uh, the d new dining hall, in Our Lady Guadalupe, and the new recreation center, and they've done that. And so now all of a sudden you look at those new buildings that were built just, you know, within the last two years, okay? And they look like they were built within the last 100 years and they fit our campus beautifully. Ellison Oxier has always been there for us. Anytime we need them, they come instantly. They, uh, if, it, if they don't feel like we're getting accomplished over the phone, they come in person. Uh, but there's never any question in your mind that they're going to respond to whatever issues come up for you. They're willing to stay within our limitations and keep things fairly conservative and help us have a unified look across our campus. So when they design a building for us and people come on our campus, I want them to think 
wow, class, professionalism, success, and excellence. And that's what they've been able to do. These architects really embraced what we were trying to accomplish, the vision of creating a Benedictine College campus that uh, would be consistent from the moment you drive in to the time you stop. And so um, that's why I really appreciate what these guys have done for us. So you can see how the client satisfaction is achieved through the efficient services by the construction engineers. Furthermore, as an architect and construction engineer, one must be equipped with the tools and techniques of restoration and conservation of historic buildings. Let's learn about the restoration techniques and application that are used by professional construction engineers in real projects. Over the course of the last 18 months, our conservators and technicians have been working to conserve and restore a French 18th century period room known as the Salon Doré. This complex project required a diverse team of experts, from architects to electricians, each with unique knowledge and skills necessary to return the room as closely as possible to its original state. Throughout its 200 plus year history, the panelling suffered water damage, mould and insect damage, and multiple and varied conservation treatments. It took us 12 days to systematically remove each section of panelling. We started at the top of the room and worked down to the floor level. The institutional wood floor was then removed and what was left was prepared to receive an original 18th century parquet floor. The gold surface had darkened in many areas and was looking very dry and patchy having lost much of its shine and luster. Through a laborious process of consolidation and cleaning, loss compensation, regilding and regeneration, the surface was brought back to life again. Similarly, the raised carved areas of leaves and ribbons had suffered losses. Plaster restorations were removed and replaced by wood carvings made by a master wood carver who skillfully recreated the style and intent of the original French carvers. The conservators also treated the overdoor panels that crown each doorway. These had suffered major breaks, resizing, clumsy repairs, and were covered in layers of paint that obscured the finer details of the surface. The overpaint layers were removed, and the old repairs were strengthened and improved. What unites the original makers and the current team is their shared dedication to perfectionism in every detail. This unflinching attention to detail has resulted in the spectacular installation that showcases both the original master skills and those of our conservation team. So you can see that how tedious work is of the restoration and conservation of the historic building. Let's go further and find out the restorative techniques further. There are a variety of machinery and chemicals required for the restoration of stone buildings and a construction engineer must know about them. In the restoration of the stone building, most significant issue is cleaning of the building and it requires extreme care so as not to damage the facade of the building. So let's see a case study like that. At Restorative Techniques, we design and formulate machinery and chemical products for cleaning and paint removal of buildings, principally listed buildings, but really all structures. Uh, there's been a reliance on uh, importing equipment and from manufacturers where the equipment is designed for general purpose use, not specifically for building conservation. And uh, this was something we felt uh, needed remedying. So some of the products that we devise are used on a small scale for sculpture and for ornamental work. Um, but we also deal with very large facades, large buildings. The Lincoln Cathedral is a Norman building and 13th and 14th century. Uh, it's one of the country's finest cathedrals. It has more carving than anywhere else in the country. The stone gradually develops a build-up of what we call black sulfation crust. So that's dirt from pollution from industry, cars and so on. It can build up to, um, in our case, sometimes an inch and a half thick. 
Partly it's disfiguring, it blocks the surface of the stone, um, the stone can begin to blister, it can introduce salts into the stone and, and over time your stone block will, or piece of sculpture will eventually need replacing. Cleaning in the past, uh, we've got some great photos of, from Victorian times and more recently of people using huge great hoses. I understand in the 60s the fire brigade did actually clean part of the West Front with their hoses. We're a bit more subtle these days. The two primary machines we use are the Thermatec, which is the superheated water machine, and also the Vortec, which is the machine that cleans with grit and water in a sort of vortex. We also use micro abraders, so very small machines that are very controllable on the sculpture. We use ammonium carbonate poultices, we use a laser. Yeah, Lincoln Limestone has a lovely um, warm orange pattern on it, which is incredibly thin. So when we clean, we have to be very careful not to break through the pattern, otherwise you do end up with a very patchy, patchy result. We clean as gently as we possibly can, so we try and stop somewhere short of very clean. Yeah. It's most particularly important not to make the equipment down to a price, but up to a quality and so we feel an obligation to use good, reliable, robust components and also to make the equipment nice to use. If the operator enjoys using it, then the result is likely to actually improve as well. It could be said that we have two broad categories of customer, those that largely know what they're doing, just need the right equipment, and those that frankly are much less sure. They have issues to deal with, not quite sure how to solve them, so uh, your problem becomes our problem and hopefully uh, uh, jointly we find a solution to, uh, to really any cleaning or paint removal issue. All right. In architectural conservation, the building and artifacts of the Islamic world are very important and of high value and need specific care and skills. Let's see case example of conservation of Damascus room in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and their restoration techniques. Well, in this project, the first step was the documentation of the existing room. Then there occurs disassembling and removal of the damaged parts and pieces from the room. Then different techniques were developed and decided for piece by piece restoration and conservation. Then a workshop and a workspace was developed for the conservation treatment of the total 209 room elements that were uh, removed from the room. And then custom fabricated hardware developed for the reassembly of the room elements from the screws to wood carving and floor tiling, wall tiling, etc. Then appropriate inch by inch measurement uh, of and uh, precision was ensured in this uh, project. Then piece by piece reassembling is done. And it includes installation of the uh, ceiling wall, the wall panels, the doors, the windows, the hold fast, the door knobs, the capping of modern screws to mimic the hand rotten nails and wall painting, plastering, etc. So you can see all these things uh, which I have told you. Here you are seeing the ceiling is being uh, done. Installing the ceiling. Here you see the door is being installed. Inch by inch measurement is done. Here is the piece by piece reassembling is done. 
Here you see the door knobs and hold fast are being done. This is the capping of the modern screws to mimic the hand room head on nails. Then there is wall painting, plastering. So in this way, uh, the room was restored and conserved. Well, I end my lecture here. Finally, as I uh, always recognize the people who are behind the lecture and I, the knowledge that I get about this topic is from these sources. And there are also videos that you have seen today. So these are the references, the web references or websites for architectural restoration and conservation and its impact on construction. And furthermore, I would continue with this uh, topic in my next lecture where I will talk about the, uh, you can say, different uh, geometry of architectural conservation and its impact and the geometry of Islamic design or Islamic uh, geometry and the uh, building of a Moroccan court. So we will see the conservation restoration project in the next class also. So I wish you good luck. Thank you very much for the listening and hope you have enjoyed this lecture and uh, Good luck and goodbye. Thank you.